How's it going? This is Matt Finch with Fit Recovery and Elevation Recovery. And in this video, you're going to learn how to stay alcohol free after you've quit. This is one of the most common questions. Uh, it's a lot of people are able to quit drinking, but they're not able to continue to stay quit long term. They can go a week or they can go a month. Maybe they can even go a year, but somehow sometime they always end up going back on alcohol and for many people it's very very often they'll be on alcohol off it on alcohol off it and so this video is entirely dedicated to once you've quit alcohol how to stay quit how to stay alcohol free for good how to enjoy it how to not care about it you're going to learn all those things you're going to learn basically conscious transformation the process of self-reinvention and the way you're going to learn that is by some success predictors that i've come up with i read a really cool book on self-reinvention and then it, it helped me to come up with this cool brainstorming idea which i did on paper i got this huge inspiration and it was all the different categories of life where when i was drinking alcohol all the time and when I was using drugs, when I was in that addiction lifestyle, what kind of my habits were like. These are basically all habits, things that can be done on a regular basis in people's regular 24 hour routines. And so, and then as a result of, you know, more than nine years now post addiction, where I used to be a hardcore alcoholic and a binge drinker, and I was an opioid addict once upon a time, I was a garbage head. I would do any drugs and any substances basically. So how did I go from that? where I was spiritually bankrupt, physically bankrupt of health. I didn't have, you know, any ambitions. I didn't have too many skills. So how did I go from that to this amazing new brain, this amazing new identity character, new emotions, just fun, a great life, really an awesome life. And it's because of the success predictors, or you could call them, you know, alcohol-free or addiction-free for life. Uh, success predictors. So I wrote those down and I came up with a really cool training. I think you're going to like it a lot. And so let's get right into it. The webinar title is how to reinvent yourself after quitting alcohol presented by myself. Obviously I'm the co-founder of elevation recovery, the founder of opiate addiction support, and I'm certified in alcohol and drug counseling, strategic intervention coaching, which is a company by Tony Robbins and Chloe Madonis, one of the most world famous family and relationship therapists. They've got a cool uh, coach training school that I did many years ago and got certified in. I'm a fit recovery coach, a Qigong teacher, and a food healing instructor as well. So what Chris Scott and I have noticed, as well as many other coaches and addiction professionals, is that the people we see that actually stay alcohol free for life and don't have any issues with it, eventually, you know, early recovery can be difficult for a lot of people, but eventually it should become very easy, effortless, unconscious to not think about alcohol in the ways that you once did. So it really comes about, you know, optimizing and transforming your physiology in empowering ways as far as in your identity, your character, your relationships, your your career, your profession, your skill set. It's about optimizing and reinventing many different areas. So like I said, the people that we see, us addiction professionals, that stay off alcohol for life or that stay off addiction in general, you know, there's lots of other maladaptive patterns and behaviors and substance use issues that people can develop after they quit drinking because it's just so hard. Their brain is wired to use either substances or behaviors as a tool to kind of increase their comfort, increase feelings of pleasure, but mostly to reduce pain. Everything humans do in life is either to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. And we'll do at least twice as much or more to avoid pain. So a lot of substance use, alcohol use, and these maladaptive patterns are to kind of self-medicate pain, immediate pain. You want to get out of immediate pain, even if the long-term negative consequences of that are really bad. So the summary of this workshop is on how to use self-reinvention, aka conscious transformation, to stay alcohol-free for life. It's really about reinventing everything about yourself and your life, or at least reinventing the things that need to be reinvented. You know, there's a lot of good aspects of you. There's a lot of good aspects of your life. If you really get down to it and think about it, there's a lot to be grateful for, for, for most people, for, for anyone, really. You can always find some things to be grateful for. So this is what we're going to cover. De uh, definition of self-reinvention, self-evaluation, my spectrum of success predictors that came up with this 
spectrum in this chart, but obviously these are on ideas that I did not come up with. It's based on a lot of years of research and studying and personal and professional development. And I've intertwined everything that I've learned and found the cool cherry picked the best things that I think will help the most amount of people to stay alcohol free for life. And we're going to talk about implementation and achieving a transformation goal. Before we get into the success predictors for staying alcohol free for life, let's kind of frame what self reinvention is. And we'll do that by asking a question. Well, how do you even know what you should be striving for? But the way to do that is to project yourself deep into the future and ask, what will I regret not having done? And then you work backward to avoid that end and use that as a way of planning your life. So before you can reinvent yourself, you have to know who you currently are and where you're currently at in life and what the decisions and behaviors and habits that you did led to those that situation and that personality and character. People need to understand their strengths, their weaknesses, their passions, and their own story. The more self-examination, self-reflection, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and, and just far more than that too, the more self-knowledge that you obtain in life, the easier it is to reinvent yourself and stay alcohol-free for life. Just before reinvention is self-evaluation. Before you can reinvent yourself or even come up with an idea of how you want to reinvent yourself, you need to know and have a really accurate appraisal of where you're currently at and how you got there. So looking at your progress, development, and learning to determine what has improved and what areas still need improvement usually involves comparing a before situation with the current situation. And so I want to tell you too that after completing the worksheets on the spectrum of success predictors, the spectrum of relapse prevention for life, the spectrum of living an awesome alcohol-free life or not, you're going to have a clear and in-depth idea about where you're currently at and how far you have to go. So if you're wondering about this, uh, these worksheets, all you got to do is go to the description box of this video. You will see a link for a download of the Spectrum of Success Predictors worksheet. The best way to get the most out of this training is to go ahead and you don't even have to give an email or anything. It's just totally free online. You just click on it and then you print it from your printer and then boom, you can just print it right out and you can fill it out right there in front of you. Or you you can you know do it in a journal it's just really powerful to have visual systems like this and also measuring systems so not only do you get a really clear idea of where you're at in these different success predictors but more importantly you can see how they all can work together to either keep you alcohol free for life or if you're not have awareness of them and trying to optimize many of them, then how that's going to derail your alcohol recovery plans over and over again. It just, it happens to the best of us. If you don't have a really solid plan, at least for early recovery and maybe even potentially beyond, the more stressful things that happen in life, the harder it is to remain alcohol free. So what exactly is self-reinvention and why is it important to us? Well, it's really the process of designing a new future you, an alcohol-free you that doesn't even care, that just looks at alcohol like such a moot and powerless substance that it's just thinking we're powerless over it is just a joke. You know, it, if when someone's powerless over alcohol, they're a little pebble. This is how I look at powerlessness. You're a little pebble, tiny little pebble rock, and alcohol is this huge boulder just so much bigger and more massive than you giant boulder is alcohol you're a little pebble so the process of well once you've transcended alcohol the process of transcending that substance to where you are recovered from it and you could care less about it you're just like nah that's the process of you becoming the boulder and alcohol becoming the pebble See, that's a good little metaphor that I like to teach people about. It can be powerful. So by doing an in-depth self-assessment and then creating some goals to aim at for your character, for your skills, for your finances, for your health, for your relationships, for your habits, for your vacations, for your family, there's so many fun goals. You're going to be designing a new future self and a new future life. Another goal of self-reinvention is integration with your three elements. We have the body over there on that picture on the left that's Chris Scott and I, it's the first time he visited me in San Diego, California at my old apartment complex where we were shooting pool and my little daughter Willow that was I think nine at the time I was doing a photo shoot for us. But we have to take care of our brains and bodies and our mind. We have to take 
back control of our habitual thoughts, negative thinking, neurotic thinking, worrying. It's it's just a plague. But when we harness our mind in powerful ways, empowering, positive, optimistic, resilient ways, this is so much more powerful for staying alcohol free. And then spirit, it's so much more helpful when we can connect to a higher life purpose, connect, find connection and love and meaning and contribution. And really that's how you get the most juice out of life is when you're optimizing and integrating your three elements. Now we've reached the self-evaluation spectrum. Again, these are the predictors of alcohol-free for life success. In my opinion, these have not been studied in research and they didn't do a huge meta-analysis study and found that these are guaranteed to be the predictors of who stays alcohol-free and who doesn't. In my opinion, and in many people's opinion, this is just kind of common sense once you see it, how these could lead to alcohol-free for life success or how they could lead to continuing to use alcohol and other maladaptive patterns of dealing with stress and other things in life. So these predictors are the culmination of some of the most important polar opposite behavior combinations that when you yourself rate them, once I teach you about them coming up right now, and you print out the form or just do it on the computer and you rate these numerically, these can lead to a very clarity enhancing, useful starting point as a self-assessment to be the end goal of self-conscious transformation, rebuild a new life, rebuild a new mindset, rebuild so much new awesome stuff that you never use alcohol again and you do not care about it. I'm really big into visual aids, and so let's do another visual aid for you. Here we go. Transforming from current self. This process is usually not fun to go through, but it's needed and and it's worth it. To an upgraded future self. The accomplishment of this is something most people will never realize, but it's truly what life is all about, and it's truly the ultimate way to transcend alcohol for good. Here's like a 50,000 foot view of my self-reinvention timeline. 2002, I became an alcoholic and I became a drug addict and I spent many years experiencing the negative consequences of that new lifestyle direction. In 2012, that's when I ended all my addictions, got healthy, started a career as an alcohol and drug certified counselor, and I got into personal development. In 2014, I started my first recovery company and website blog, my first coaching program, and I began loving life a lot more because I was doing what I loved for a living, and it was really creative and a fun project that was helping a lot of people and still is. In 2019, I started Elevation Recovery with Chris Scott, and now in 2021, we have uh, 187 episodes at the making of this webinar that have been listened to by close to a quarter of a million people in probably 60 to 70 percent of the planet. We can actually see who and what countries and what parts of the world people are listening to Elevation Recovery. It's in almost every country. It's really awesome. So you can really reinvent yourself. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, it's not something that happens like necessarily super fast, but you can make a lot of progress and a little amount of time in certain situations. And even if it takes a lot of time to make a little progress, it's, I mean, what else are you going to do? You're either going to stay where you are, you're going to go backwards, or you're going to go forwards. And what I've found is that the people that are the happiest in life are the ones that are making progress. Even if it's just a little bit of progress, even if it's just, you know, they're making 1% progress towards their goals per month. If they're moving in the direction of their dreams and they're seeing that progress actually happen, boy, that's a, that's addictive in a good way. That's, that is really, it just helps to harness our minds and focus on, okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. When we're stuck, when we're going down into a rut or into a further rut or deeper into an addiction, when we're going, when our life's getting worse, Ooh, it's, it's hard to feel happy when that's happening. Not impossible, but so yeah, this is that's just a little process of looking at 20,000, 40,000 foot view of self reinvention. As you can see, it happened over quite a timeline. But you know, now Chris and I are doing this type of content to help others, to help you, and to help others to achieve self reinvention, alcohol freedom, and, and health in all the domains of life much faster because with new information and strategic information that you can build your plan better and with better plans and better implementation of those plans, you can get better results.
Here are the three steps to reinvent yourself. Step one, self-assessment. That's what we're doing in this video today. I promise we're almost to the slide that we begin to do that. Uh, but the first step is to do a detailed and honest evaluation of yourself, including your behaviors, mindset, and more. Number two is set yourself some informed aims after learning where you're doing well and where you're lacking quite a bit. Set some aims that you feel would serve you the most. Number three, define who you want to become and why. Fulfillment is not tied to goals, but in becoming the person you need to become in order to reach your goals. After chasing happiness through success for many years, I realized that it you know, wasn't about success, so to speak. It was about building my character. It was about building my health. It was about building my relationships. It was about optimizing my friendships. It was about building so much recovery capital and healthy resources, adaptive resources for getting through life and adapting to the challenges and struggles of life and health issues and relationship issues and, and being able to do that with more grace and with more self-efficacy and with more agency and less maladaptive habits, you know, pr preferably no maladaptive habits and patterns. But anyways, it really is about who you become when you're achieving these goals. So I really, I'm super excited about the topic of self-transformation as a vehicle, as a, as a Ferrari to transcend alcohol addiction for good and to transcend any different challenge, you know, any challenge. It's about reinventing yourself, reinventing your life. We can live so much. We can do so much to reach our potential if we didn't hold ourselves back so much. My alcohol-free for life success indicator categories are the following habits. These are the program thoughts and behaviors we do automatically or mostly automatically as a result of either proactively or reactively doing them. Psychology, that's our mindset and our emotions we've developed over the course of our life, which guides how we view people and things. Our relationships, which are the intimate and non-intimate connections we have with people, such as family, loved ones, friends, coworkers, etc., and health, our physiological wellness and vitality and constitution deals with the physical brain, our physical organs, and all areas of our physical body systems. These are the different categories of the success indicator spectrum. And so we're going to get into all this stuff. And it really is, if you can optimize the different predictors in these different indicator categories, then you can just not only stay alcohol free for life, but you can pretty much do almost anything you want to do. For staying alcohol-free for life or achieving any other goals, here's the success formula. Develop and write down informed aims, then take massive action on moving towards those aims, and then measure, adjust approach if necessary, keep learning and growing. Ultimately, you have a clear vision of what you want, then you find someone else who has obtained what you want, you find out what they did, and you see if you can model what they did, that is, do the same thing they did, and to get the same results. That can work a lot of the time, not all the time, but it can work a lot. So by watching this webinar training with me, you're going to be able to do all these things. You're going to be able to have a self-assessment starting point. And from that, you can develop and write down informed goals, and then you can take action on those. You can continue to measure, continue to optimize, and continue to adjust approaches as necessary if things are not getting you closer to your goals. If you're getting closer to your goals, you keep going with the same approaches. If you're getting further away or you're not getting closer, you change it up. It's a pain in the butt. I've been doing this for years and years and years, and I've realized that it just never ends. You know, life's always going to throw you curveballs. There's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be things that come up that uh, really knock you off your butt. It's about being able to adjust, adapt, improvise, overcome, you know, think different ways, do different things. You know, life is a long time. So the faster we can get really good at uh, the game of life, the faster we can start to enjoy it a lot more on a much more regular basis. Here's a fun fact, or actually it's kind of disturbing how you, however you look at it. Approximately 3% of humans do this type of intense self-evaluation and self-reinvention work. This is just my best guess, which is based on lots of research. Many other people estimate it to be around there too. That's okay because you're one of the 3%. You're watching this video doing the work, so congratulations for you. An estimated 20% set goals sometimes and learn here and there, but not daily. An estimated 77% do no goal setting or personal development whatsoever. 
the very next slide after this, we're finally going to get into the predictors. I'm sorry it took so long to actually lead up to it, but I wanted to do a good job framing self-reinvention in this process of conscious transformation. I think it was important to do so. I'm sure some people skipped ahead and I might have done the same as well. But this is the last slide before the predictors. Self-reinvention progress, according to life, is not a straight or linear path. There are ups and downs and backtracks and ruts and a whole lot more. Welcome to the Alcohol Free for Life Success Predictors Spectrum. On the left side, we have pathological preoccupation. That's thinking, worrying, or obsessing about one, several, or many things. It's the destroyer of absolute focus, and most people are driven by this pathological preoccupation. So as you can see numerically, in the middle, that's just totally neutral, we have zero. Then on the left side, pathological preoccupation, it goes negative one to negative 10. The opposite of that, the antithesis, the, the absolute antithesis of pathological preoccupation is absolute focus. That is staying in the present moment and only focusing on the task at hand or the experience in the present moment the top skill to achieve any goal. The people that are able to harness and maintain absolute focus for long periods of time seem to be the people that get stuff done in life, including the goals that they want to get done, and they just seem to be unstoppable. Pathological preoccupation is an epidemic in the United States and several other countries. The reason it has become so high is because obviously smartphones and social media and YouTube, people are on screens a lot, lots of dopamine boosts, lots of things that it fulfills for us, which can make them highly habit forming. The unfortunate part is this can also lead to pathological preoccupation and also short attention spans and more. So this is the first predictor. These are in no particular order. So go ahead and rate yourself if you've already printed out this thing, you could even do this as like a in-process workshop as I'm teaching it, or you could do it later. But when you actually do the rating, you just rate, well, am I a zero or am I a 10 absolute focus, positive 10 that would be, or am I a negative 10 on this one? Pathological preoccupation to the ultimate degree. As you can see, there's that's a huge distance between a 10 absolute focus and a 10 pathological preoccupation. Most people are somewhere in between there, somewhere in that spectrum. And the goal of all these to be alcohol free for life and to do it with ease and grace and to be able to crush it at everything or most of the things you set out and do is to be have high score in the positives and low scores in these negatives on these predictors. Moving on to predictor number two, on the left in the negatives, we have instant gratification. That's making decisions based on how to experience pleasure right now and avoid pain right now, instead of making decisions based on the delayed rewards that come much later. And on the positive side, we have delayed gratification, which is the complete opposite. All of the ones on the right are the complete antithesis, the complete opposite of the ones on the left. Making decisions based on what the best long-term results would be and deferring gratification from the present to the future. Most people live in a mode of making their most of their decisions based on instant gratification. They want to either avoid pain right now in the present and gain pleasure or gain pleasure or both. And doesn't matter what the future consequences of that are because what matters in the moment is that instant alleviation of pain and moving towards pleasure, moving away from pain, moving towards more pleasure. Delayed gratification is being able to endure pain, in, endure pain during the day, put off, you know, pleasure, endure pain if you have to, and long range goals. It's about doing the things that need to be done, even if they're painful, even if they suck, because the future rewards of those actions and behaviors over time are going to be so much payoff that it's worth it. Predictor number three is whether a person has a reactive morning routine or a proactive morning routine. And a reactive morning routine would be habitual, automatic, reactions and response to life, for instance, social media, emails, other people's demands, where we react to the day and other people instead of plan the day out ourselves. And a proactive morning routine would be planned out and played out according to the plan, which is your plan, which sets your day up for success and helps you maintain agency over your life. I have to say that having a really healthy, proactive morning routine and doing that every single morning is literally one of the best things any person can do to stay alcohol-free after they've quit. 
Predictor number four is a goldfish attention span versus Buddhist monk attention span. <laughs> so a goldfish attention span. The new phenomenon that humans have a short attention span around goldfish time, seven to nine seconds, instead of 20 minutes like it was in the recent past. So I hope, I really hope that you don't have a negative 10 on this one. Imagine trying to stay alcohol free with a really horrible negative 10 on this one versus a positive 10. So that's the most ultimate Buddhist monk attention span. I don't have close to a 10, but it's definitely somewhere on the positive side and it's you know definitely not negative. Monks are often able to focus on a single mantra for hours or even the entire day without thinking of anything else. Their attention is under their agency. They've got full control over it like other humans probably don't even have a dream of ever obtaining. That takes a lot of practice. You, If you have a goal of wanting to get to a positive 10 on this one, go for it. But certainly you don't need to have a Buddhist monk attention span to stay alcohol free for life. But like I said, I, I'll keep reiterating this. The more you can have these predictors being scored on the positive range, and you might not score a lot of these positive today, that you might have a lot of bad scores today. Doesn't matter. This is a self-evaluation assessment starting point. It's to get data. It's to measure things and get a starting point to, okay, well, here's where I am, and I want to get to, you know, you make goals. Well, here's where I'd like to be. Then you can make plans as a result of those goals. Alcohol free for life success predictor number five is totally distractible versus indistractable. I read a really cool book recently called Indistractable and it helped me a lot. It made me really minimalize my life, digital minimalism, life minimalism, and as a result, I'm so much less distracted than I was before. As a result of that, I'm much happier, my mental health's a lot better, and I'm actually getting a lot more done. So totally distractible, that'd be having a lifestyle where it's easy to get interrupted by people, text messages, phone calls, emails, social media alerts and announcements, and other notifications that ping, ding, ring, and other sounds. Versus a positive 10 indistractable, that is having a lifestyle where it's impossible for people or technology to interrupt and distract you when you're in your indistractable mode. So a lot of people could use a lot of work in this area. I needed so much work in this area, even as little as about a year and a half ago, you know, and I'm more than nine years addiction, you know, past addiction. And even that I was so distractible, it was crazy. So a lot of people can make a lot of progress typically in this one. And as you'll notice, a lot of these predictors have to do with focus and attention and distractibility or indistractibility, you know, because that's that really is the keys. If you can focus and stay in the present moment and avoid or eliminate or reduce distractions and interruptions and you have clarity on what you want to do with minimal or no distractions during that time and you've got that focus, that long attention span, it's just the sky's the limit what you can achieve. And, and as a result of having so much agency over what you do with your 24 hours per day, compared to so many other people that, that are just doing the same things over and over because they can't get out of the, that habit loop. When you are able to just get such crystal clear vision for your life and you have so much f attention span and focus ability and indistractability, you, you, you just when you when you can start living like that the thought of going back to how life was before is just laughable um, it's like you feel like you've been freed from that horrible distraction and, and ADD ADHD stuff where you're so ah, you know living in reaction living in reaction it raises cortisol it raises adrenaline it raises noradrenaline which are all stress hormones when you're proactive, when you can focus, when you have more agency over your mind, your thoughts and your emotions and your behaviors, it's all about discipline and agency. And so, yeah, this is a big one right here. The sixth predictor is virtually no aims versus sniper aiming on targets. Let's first cover virtually no aims. That would be not having any goals or direction as to what you'd like your life to look like in the future and hoping for things to just work out somehow without making plans as opposed to a positive 10 on the other side the complete antithesis and opposite sniper aiming on targets that could be a detailed vision vision of the future you'd like to create for yourself with concrete goals action plans and processes for achieving your desired outcomes 
Predictor number seven is non-starter quitter versus Navy SEAL training grit. Let's start on the left, non-starter quitter. So this would be no passion and no perseverance. A person that is not excited about much, negative, and either quits things they start or never even try in the first place versus the opposite of that would be Navy SEAL training grit. A combination of passion and perseverance is grit. Matter of fact, I read a book called Grit and it was just so amazing. It's all about grit, which is passion, the combination of passion and perseverance. Navy SEALs have some of the most grit ever to be able to make it all the way through their week-long test to get their trident or fail. Oftentimes in these Navy SEAL trainings, it's called BUDS, oftentimes it's not the people that are the most physically fit, have the best endurance, that are the most muscular, or have the best endurance. Usually the people that make it through that are the ones that have the most grit, the most persistence, passion, and perseverance to see that very difficult training all the way through to the end. It's the ones that can dig deep and, and have that those powerful reasons why that passion and perseverance versus someone without that there it doesn't matter how fit and how hardcore you are if you don't have that passion to make it through then those are the people that quit buds and don't become a navy seal the eighth predictor is circle of negative influence versus circle of positive influence a circle of negative influence would be when the five people you hang out with the most in life are all bad influences and being around is making it much harder to reach your goals and dreams for better life this would be back in my 20s when i was trying to stay alcohol free after i had quit and the five people that i hung out with the most were all drinking alcohol on a daily basis i had a a, a circle of influence that was totally counterproductive to my goals of staying alcohol free <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It was only when I ditched that circle of influence for a positive circle of influence that I was able to stay drug-free and alcohol-free. So let's do circle of positive influence. This is when the five people you hang out with the most are all excellent, extraordinary influences on you. And they're the type of people that having in your life makes it easier to be alcohol-free, makes it easier to grow makes it easier to achieve your dream life. It makes it just, you want the people in your life to be huge assets to helping you become better and, and do better for the world. You don't want them to be hindrances. Of course, there's there might not be any way to get rid of certain people, but certainly you can limit the amount of time that you do give to people like that in your life. So your circle of positive influence is all about building very powerful relationships for helping you stay alcohol free and for helping you do anything that you want to do. They're just the power of your network. The power of your support group is one of the most important things. It could even be the most important thing as far as if you're going to get what you want in life. It's, you know, you might have heard that quote. It's not what you know, it's who you know. It was only when I really ditched all my old friends and enlisted the help and support and accountability of my parents, my family, and a few close friends that were good influences. It was only when I did that that I was finally able to change for good and make rapid progress and continue that cycle. Predictor number nine is either being in a consistently in a negative state or consistently in a peak state or a positive state, a healthy state. So let's start on the left. Consistently in a negative state. That would be a psychophysio state in which you feel bad physically and you're in a fearful or negative emotional state as well, making it hard to see the good in life and take action on goals. You would much rather ha want to have a consistently in a peak state or consistently in a positive, loving, empowering, healthy state. So this would be excellent psychophysio state in which your body feels great, your mindset and attitude are in a good place, and you're full of passion and energy and confidence and inner peace. That would be a plus 10. So, you know, this is about being consistently. Maybe you're consistently in a plus three positive peaks you know state maybe you're only at a plus four that's certainly better than negative six negative eight you know some of my clients that are on alcohol they'll go from being in a like a negative eight on alcohol because they're so sick from it in a very short amount of time maybe a week or two sometimes three weeks to all of a sudden be at a plus six or a plus seven that's rapid transformation staying alcohol free for life is about state management the more you're aware of your state and how you're 
the things you're eating, the things you're putting in your body and drinking, the actions and behaviors that you're doing, to be aware of how those are influencing your state, your psychophysio state, how they're either making it worse or making it better, and how to live in a place where you know the healthy things that help to keep you in a positive emotional and mental and physical state. And so I'd, I have a lot of those tools now. I'd, I have so many different resources and strategies and things that I can take or that I can eat or that I can do or that I can think. <laughs> so many cool resources to help me elevate my physical, mental, emotional, spiritual state. And when you're really big, like me, into state management, and you know how to healthily, adaptively stay in a good state, and then if you're, you know, you're kind of tired or what, you know, doesn't matter. You can't stay in a great state every day for your whole life, 24/7. But you can very consistently be in an awesome state. It's a lot about how you, it's a lot about how you think. You know, certainly it has to do with exercise and diet and supplements and other uh, natural therapies. But a big part of it is how you think, how you use your mind, the way you think about things. That is such a huge predictor of whether we're going to be in a good state or not. It's about lifestyle strategies, many different things, exercise, meditation. You know, Chris has done so many awesome videos on fit recovery and his course, Total Alcohol Recovery 2.0, has everything on how to change your state. So very good tips and strategies for free on this YouTube channel, on the fit recovery blog at fit recovery.com forward slash blog. And when people are in a negative state consistently, just they can't stay off alcohol. They can't stay alcohol free. I got a new client three weeks ago. She said she quit drinking for a year and most of that whole year didn't feel good. She still had anxiety. She still had depression, but she wasn't exercising. She wasn't taking the right supplements. She wasn't eating great. She was lonely. It was the before the pandemic. And so she had broken up with a boyfriend and stuff. And she was in a really, really consistently negative state. And so when she wasn't drinking, this is like a year alcohol free, consistently in a pretty negative state, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual state. After a while, she said, screw it, started drinking again. And so if she would have been in a consistently good feeling state, she wouldn't have needed to drink the alcohol. People only drink alcohol to change the way they're feeling. They don't like the way they're feeling in the moment. So they want to drink alcohol to feel how they want to feel or to feel closer to how they want to feel in the moment. So, you know, we drink alcohol because we want to feel like the alcohol makes us feel. But if you can feel freaking epic without alcohol, then there's really no need to drink it. And that's how Chris feels nowadays. That's how I feel nowadays. You know, we take, we have healthy things that make us feel great. We don't need to rely on binge drinking or hardcore drinking like we did in the past. So predictor number 10 is comfort zone lifestyle versus growth zone lifestyle. We'll start with comfort zone lifestyle, which is a lifestyle in which the main driver in your decisions and actions is the desire to be as comfortable as possible as much as possible, where you never go outside your comfort zone unless you're forced. Versus on the opposite side of that spectrum, a growth zone lifestyle, a lifestyle in which the main driver of your decisions and actions is the desire to grow, to overcome challenges, and you're constantly pushing yourself to live up to your potential. This is a very important topic, too, because back in the day when I was addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to all sorts of maladaptive coping tools for life, I had a serious comfort zone lifestyle. And that's because I also had a fixed mindset. Back then, I thought, well, my mindset and my brain are fixed. So this is what I got. And it's not very good. So I can't do much in life anyway. So I might as well just have fun and have pleasure. I'm not going to live past 30 or 40 anyways. Versus a growth mindset. It was only when I traded in my faulty fixed mindset for an empowering growth mindset, which is the belief that I'm not fixed. I can enhance my mindset. I can change the way I think. I can grow my skills and my knowledge and my mental fortitude. There's an awesome book by Carol Dweck called Mindset, huge bestseller. And it's all about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Having a growth mindset is one of the key predictors of being able to stay alcohol-free for life. 
Predictor 11 is actually one of my favorite ones. I believe it's also one of the most powerful ones for determining who's going to stay alcohol free for life or not. So let's start with emotion based making of decisions. That's when you make your decisions based on whether you want to do something or not do something, regardless of whether or not it's in your best self interest. So this is about making decisions based on how you're feeling. When you wake up super early, if you had a commitment to go with your friend to the gym and you wake up and you're warm in your cozy bed and you're tired and you don't want to get up because you're going to feel pain and it's going to be a hassle to go do that. And, oh, I'll just start working out tomorrow. And that's when you tell your friend, you know, let's just do it another day or you make up an excuse. That's making a decision based on your emotions, based on how you're feeling. You feel good in your bed, you're warm and you're tired and, and you want to keep resting in bed and being warm. Your best self-interest would be to to keep up to your word. You told your friend you were going to go to the gym. So what's in your best self-interest is to keep your word and to go get start getting fit, start getting healthy, start optimizing your brain at the gym. So it's a it's a radical. Most humans go around all day every day making mostly emotion-based decisions. Most decisions most humans rarely make most of their decisions based on what's in their best self-interest. We're highly illogical most humans, very emotional. So now let's talk about self-interest based decision making. I can't say the word decision today. When you make decisions based on what's in your best self-interest and not based on whether you want to do something or not. If it's in your best self-interest, you do do it regardless of how you feel. That's the key decider right there. This is a very hard skill for a lot of people, especially people that are recently off of alcohol. They're used to making lots of decisions based on how they're feeling. They're not used to making most of their decisions based on what's in their best self-interest. If they were used to that, then they probably would already be off alcohol. So as you can see, when you're able to make most of your decisions on a day-to-day -day basis based on what's in your best self-interest and not based on how you're feeling, then you can stay alcohol-free and achieve so much more in life. If you are totally prone to making decisions based on how you're feeling and not what's in your best interest, that is a recipe that continues to lead so many people back to drinking alcohol and back to other maladaptive coping tools for life after they've committed to abstaining from them. Predictor number 12 has to do with time management. On the left negative side, we have zero planning or even using a to-do list versus on the right positive side, block time planning. We'll start on the left. Zero planning. This is when you wake up each and every day and you just do what you're scheduled to do, like work nine to five. And then you figure out the rest as you're going along through the day. On the right, block time planning. A plus 10 of this would be when you go by a daily planner that you fill out and even block off time slots for certain activities. And then when those blocks of scheduled time come, you do what's written there. Block time. It's where you block out time in your daily schedule, or maybe it's on a Monday through Friday, or maybe you just have one day blocked off. The people that go off to-do lists, yeah, that, that's better than not having anything. The next best step up from that would be to actually use a planner. The next best step up from that would be to do a planner where you're actually scheduling all the different things and blocking time, at least blocking time for the key important things that you want to do that for. The better you get at time management, the more fun life becomes, the more agency you have over your life and your activities. A lot of people look at it as a constraint. Oh, I don't want to be tied into like a schedule and block time or anything. But really, by doing that, it gives you so much freedom. It's ridiculous. It's counterintuitive. It seems like by scheduling and block time planning and using a planner, you're kind of like losing a lot of freedom. No, 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 no. It's the complete opposite. The more you do that, the more freedom you have. Predictor number 13 is consistent shallow breathing versus consistent belly breathing and coherence. So let's start with consistent shallow breathing. That is when most of the day you're breathing short breaths from chest or nose and not getting nearly as much oxygen as a healthy breather. People that are consistent shallow breathers have more anxiety, more muscular tension, more negative mood states, just less, far less overall mental health and physical health. We need oxygen really, really badly. And most Americans don't know how to breathe. Most Americans are consistently shallow breathing and they're breath holding a lot of the time. And so throughout the day, if you're not like doing breathing exercises to recalibrate until you've actually learned how to do belly breathing throughout the day. This is one of the most lowest hanging fruit areas to revolutionize your health. You know, imagine 
eating well, exercising, and taking supplements, etc. If you're a shallow breather, if you're not getting enough oxygen, you're going to not get nearly as good of gains from those other health strategies if you're not getting enough oxygen. This is something that my brother taught me how to do many years ago. He was a shallow breather. He had a lot of anxiety, and he watched a TED Talk video on how shallow breathing causes. The more shallow you breathe and the more you hold your breath, the more your mind races. The more you have controlled, rhythmic, deep belly breathing, the less thoughts you think. It calms your parasympathetic nervous system. You have more presence and more calmness and more agency to be able to do what you want. You're not neurotically thinking lots of thoughts. That is a huge result from consistently shallow breathing. It leads to neurotic thinking. I'm living proof that you can fix it. You can fix neurotic thinking by one thing, fixing your breathing. It takes more than just that for a lot of people. It did for me, but that's one of the things people with anxiety disorders should learn how to do is how to breathe healthily. That might not cure them. It probably won't, but it is a huge helpful strategy. Most Americans don't know how to breathe properly. Versus consistent belly breathing and coherence. This is when you're breathing in your belly and the inhales and exhales are the same duration and force, thus hyperoxygenating the body and achieving a state of coherence where it's rhythmic breathing, your heart, your rhythm, your biorhythm come into center. It's, it's how we are designed. And when we can unlock that natural default mechanism, it can really help your health, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. It's all interrelated, interconnected can totally help you stay alcohol free for life. Predictor number 14 is one of the biggest ones by far. Eating healthily 0% of the time versus eating healthily and taking healthy supplements over 80% of the time. Let's start on unhealthily. That's living off a diet of fast food and junk food, soda, and other things that are loaded with calories and depleted of nutrition. Just loaded with crap. High calorie, low nutrient density. That is the standard American diet. Why so many Americans are getting COVID. The people that are getting the worst cases of COVID and hospitalizations and death, those are the people that are obese, diabetic, don't exercise, eat like horrible, and there might be genetic stuff as well, but it's typically people that are older, morbidly obese, and diabetic, or they have heart problems, narrow arteries, just it's a life of lots of eating bad foods and not getting enough exercise. So anyways, eating healthy over 80% of the time and taking healthy supplements, that would be eating in a way that eight out of every 10 meals or snacks, you're having something very healthy for your individual biochemistry. And only two out of 10 times, you're eating whatever you want or drinking whatever you want uh, other than alcohol obviously regardless of nutrition so even seven out of ten 70 percent of the time you know if you if 70 percent of the foods and beverages and supplements you consume are all really healthy things and 30 percent of the time or 20 percent of the time you're literally eating whatever you want for taste for comfort for whatever you know most people are going to be pretty darn healthy as long as they're doing other health strategies as well as diet and supplements but but anyway so this is like something that i had to learn over time I went, when I started eating healthy, I tried to be 100%. And if I wasn't 100% perfect all the time, I'd beat myself up and I would stress if I was didn't have anything that was on my specific diet. And I actually made me really unhealthy being that militant about health foods. It made me more healthy. I was neurotic about food. You don't want to be neurotic about food. So this is a more moderation way of you can still eat whatever the hell you want. It's just most of the time you're eating what you should be eating and very rarely or you know, a little bit here and there, you're eating anything. And you know, this could be the largest predictor of whether or not someone's going to stay alcohol free for life or not. The biggest component of alcohol addiction and alcohol recovery is the brain. Alcohol is a physical substance that negatively impacts a physical organ. The brain, it's a pretty important one. It's our supercomputer that operates everything. The, the only problem is when most people quit alcohol, the common knowledge or the common wisdom and advice is to go to 12-step meetings, to go to perhaps counseling, psychiatry. There's nothing wrong with those. Those are actually very awesome resources for a lot of different people. The problem is that none of them impact the damage that drugs, that alcohol has done to the brain. None of them do that. What does reverse the damage that alcohol has done to the brain and the liver and the pancreas and the kidneys and other organs, but the brain especially, uh, what does help that is nutrition, your diet, specific foods and drinks. What does help that is specific supplements. 
What does help that is exercise, sunlight, healthy sleep, healthy water in, in abundance, breathing correctly, these, these natural medicine things like environmental medicines and foods. It's just, this is such a huge predictor of who's going to stay off alcohol for life and who's going to get back on it. The people that continue to eat crappy diets, that continue to not make their health a massive priority, those are the people that continue to go back on alcohol the most. The individuals that clean up their diets, that learn how to eat for alcohol recovery and for their individual biochemistry, and then they consistently do that and take supplements that are specified for at least you know getting off alcohol initially, but maybe for their biochemical deficiencies, their biochemical individuality. This is such a huge thing that certainly learning to eat for your specific biochemistry, learning to take targeted nutraceuticals and neuronutrients for your specific biochemical individuality and your specific needs and your specific goals, that is one of the hugest predictors, if not the hugest predictor. It's so huge because it's the biochemical foundation pillar of all recovery treatment, whether it's alcohol recovery, drug recovery, any type of addiction you want to start with rebuilding the body and brain. You're literally rebuilding your central nervous system after you quit drinking. So the people that stay off alcohol typically are the ones that learn how to get their brain feeling great and their just their mood, their energy, their health is awesome without alcohol, without substances, without needing to like consume lots of sugar and caffeine and alcohol to get all these positive feelings. The ones that really do a health transformation and you have to keep, here's the, here's the caveat. You need to keep it up over time. For many years after I quit drugs and alcohol, my diet was good. But then for years, it was on and off. It was on and off for years. And I gained a bunch of weight and I became flabby and my muscles went away. And man, I didn't get back into substance addiction back then or alcoholism. But I started to really just binge on food, uh, comfort foods and Netflix. I'd watch like 12 hours of Netflix a day some days. Sometimes for a week, that's all I would do. And I would not work and I would not do anything. And so, yeah, even after long after you've quit alcohol or other addictive chemicals, natural or pharmaceutical or semi-synthetic or what, if you're not concentrating on your diet consistently, it's going to be really easy to feel like shit. Even if you're not using alcohol, even if you're not on drugs or whatever, if you're not, if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, it's very easy to feel bad. It's very easy to have mental health problems. It's very easy to feel tired and sick. So yeah, I spent a lot of time on this one because it's so important, probably the most important thing that you could do. It supports everything else. If you're not eating at least well, and taking at least some key supplements to offset deficiencies. If you're not doing at least that bare minimum, whew, staying off alcohol for life is going to be more difficult than it has to be. This is another huge predictor. Number 15, exercising zero times per week versus exercising just enough without overtraining for your physical needs. So let's start on exercising zero times per week. That would be not even going for a walk one time a week. This is truly getting zero exercise in a given seven day period. Well, not zero because you're still moving around your house and everything, but I don't actually consider that exercise. That's movement. So you're not getting no movement per week. Although a lot of people are hardly getting any movement. They're sitting on their butts all the time. Oh boy, that's so bad for your health. It's ridiculous. So now let's look at the opposite. That would be exercising just enough without overtraining. So after finding a great workout regimen for your body and for your life and for your preferences, desires, physical needs, going by this every week with consistency, even when you don't feel like it. So some people, you know, they feel their best when they're exercising five times a week by running. Some people feel their best when they swim three times per week. Some people feel their best when they're playing sports and then doing, you know, playing sports a lot and then going to the gym once or twice to do stretching and some weight training and some other types of, you know, maybe uh, sp sports specific exercises. It's so customizable. So it's really about finding what your specific needs are at the current time, that current time in your life, and then doing that. 
best way to do that is to work with a great personal trainer. Uh, I know not a lot of people can afford that. You know, I've never had a physical fitness personal trainer, but there's great teachers on YouTube that you can watch for free. There's so much information out there. What I've found, the key is to actually consistently exercising, do stuff that you like. If you're not gonna, if you don't like it, you're not gonna continue to do it over time unless you begin to like it. There's a chance that you might not like something at the beginning. Say for instance, you just start swimming or something. You might hate it at the beginning, but then maybe you start to get good at it and you start to really like it, who knows? But unless you eventually start to really like it, you're probably not gonna keep doing it over time. This is something I really had to realize. I, I wanted to do certain types of exercise because I thought that would make me look how I wanted to look, but I hated doing those things and so I didn't keep them up. And so now I do stuff that I like, that makes me healthy, that I feel great afterwards, that makes me look good. And, you know, as a result, I've been able to keep that up very consistently, except for maybe the first six months of COVID. Uh, I didn't work out that much at all because I was just so thrown off my routine. So this is a huge predictor right here. The people that do what I call the key three, diet, supplements and exercise. I, I consider those the key three for alcohol recovery for life without ever taking another sip again, or at least never getting addicted to it again. Maybe you find that, you know, later on in life, you can actually drink responsibly. You know, people that does happen. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. But the main thing is the people that are in a good state, exercising, key three, exercise, diet, supplements. If they're doing that and they're doing that consistently, ah, there's just no need there's no need for alcohol when you're doing that stuff. You're between the exercise, the dopamine, the endorphins, the GABA, the serotonin, the oxytocin, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the endocannabinoids. Those are all released when you exercise. Literally brain-building, mood-boosting, relaxation-inducing, neuropharmaceutical endogenous neurochemicals from your endogenous neuropharmacy of these things that make us feel wonderful exercise, natural highs, diet, supplements, this is all just epic stuff. We have one more predictor to go and then we'll follow up. And finally, last but not least, we have predictor number 16, no active sleep routine versus a proactive sleep routine. So this is a very important topic. Sleep is such a huge predictor of health. And like, like I said, with state management, the healthier you feel physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially, the less you're going to care about alcohol. It's just as simple as that. The worse you're off in those areas, the more alcohol is going to seem like a good resource for numbing those bad feelings. So let's go to no active sleep routine. That'd be having zero sleep rituals and literally just going to bed whenever you want and it's changing day by day and you're watching screens with blue light for hours before bed even while you're falling asleep and the worst would be to have it on while you're asleep the whole night. Blue light destroys healthy sleep. So a proactive sleep routine and one that is customized for your individual needs, this can help to fortify your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health and help you to stay off alcohol for life. So this would be having no caffeine after a certain time of day. Some people, it's best if they don't have caffeine after 12. Some people, it might be 1 or 2 p.m. Some people that are very sensitive to it probably shouldn't have it after 10 a.m. But no caffeine after a certain time, the same general bedtime and wake up time daily. This is huge for people's health, especially for mental health, for physical health. When you have the same bedtime and general wake up time helps to really habitualize your sleep and just epic for helping you have more of a foundation. Uh, and then no screens for at least one hour or longer before bed, unless you're wearing blue light blocking glasses. But even then still, it's just better. The last hour before bed, it's better to be kind of just winding down. You're reading in candlelight or reading with red light or journaling or reading the Bible or, or whatever floats your boat, you know? And then you're optimizing your sleep for your sleep type needs. So me, I do best when I go to bed, you know, around 9 to 10 p.m. Or maybe in the winter, 8 p.m. And in the summer, 10 p.m., something like that. It changes. But around, you know, 8.30 to 10, 10.30 p.m., my best bedtime. And then I do best when I get around 8 or 9 hours of sleep. That's just me. Some people are different. But it's about... The best would be finding what your sleep type is. Are you a night owl? Are you someone that likes to go to bed early? So, you know, depending on your sleep type, 
you might actually do best in life and have the easiest time being healthy and feeling awesome by going to bed at like 2 a.m. or something and then sleeping seven or eight hours. You know, it could be different. You might feel your best by going to bed at 9.30 p.m. So it really is a huge topic. There's a lot of different research and different ideas regarding these. Here's some general optimizations, but this is a huge one. So we've talked about things from these different categories, right? Things like your sleep and your nutrition, and your supplements, and your exercise, your focus, your time management, your growth mindset, your planning, your indistractability, a lot of different things we covered. Again, these were in no particular order. This is just my opinion. I, in my opinion, these are some of the most powerful predictors of a person of who's going to stay off alcohol for life and not have an issue with it, and who's going to be people that chronically continue to get back on alcohol, get off, get back on, do other maladaptive patterns. You know, it's if you want to really optimize your health and optimize your mindset, optimize your life, optimize your goal setting. These success predictors right here are certainly a powerful way to do it. Now I've given you some training tips on how you can rate yourself in these different categories. We've got a numerical rating system. You can go to the description box of this video, find the link to click on, and you can either just look at it on your phone or whatever other device you have, or you can actually print out the slides for this video, physically write it in, Put it up in your wall somewhere, write out the numbers that you want to get to. If you want to go from like a negative three in something to a positive three in something in the next 90 days, you can write a plan on how to do that. Obviously, you don't, you're not going to change all these things overnight. This is like long game strategy stuff. This is a tool that you can use to have a kind of a mental model, so to speak, of these are some of the predictors. This is the spectrum of predictors of not just staying alcohol free, but just having a great, awesome life in general. Do you agree? It's self-reinvention is self-reinvention. You could use this um, after quitting alcohol or to lose weight and keep the weight off or to be better, a uh, better husband or wife, for instance. You know, the better you get, the more stuff you have on the high positive side as a score on these predictors, these spectrums, as you can see, the, the just the easier life's going to be, the more you're going to be able to become, the more you're going to be able to build your character and your life and your relationships. It's so fun. It's a very fun project, if you ask me. Don't be a person that just watches something and doesn't take action on it. Be an implementer. Be a speedy implementer. Implementation. Here's the process 101. Evaluate. So score yourself on the 16 predictors to assess where you're currently at. Then plan. Write down which predictors you're going to work on the most. Next is develop. Number three, write down your strategy for working on the predictors. Four, implement. Create a start date and implement the plan on your start date. Five, succeed. Keep going even when it's hard until you're reinvented. The compound effect is something that seriously works to your advantage too when you're embarking on this process of self-reinvention as a tool to stay alcohol-free for life and create an awesome life in general. Starts off with tiny changes, these little small baby step changes, ones that are easy and simple, which anyone can keep going if they want to. So you do those and you keep those going. And then after weeks, months, and especially years, the compound effect says that those tiny changes that you keep doing over time add up to gigantic results, compounded results, as you go these tiny changes over time. The result of that compound effect over time is a new life. The compound effect will eventually lead to a new life if you've made enough small changes and let them compound for long enough. If you are scoring either by writing it down or either, you know, in your head, keeping score in your head, if you scored yourself through this training, how did you score? Do you have room for improvement? Are you ready to reinvent yourself? And are you ready to start now, do the hard work, be consistent, and dedicate yourself to excellence? And always remember, every positive change in your life begins with a clear, unequivocal decision that you're going to either do something or stop doing something anonymous. And that concludes our training on how to stay alcohol free for life after you've quit. I hope you enjoyed watching and learning from it even half as much as I enjoyed making this training for you. Again, my name is Matt Finch with Fit Recovery and Elevation Recovery. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.